For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Well, with verse 18, as we discussed last time, we officially move out of the sanctification portion of Romans and onto that of glorification. From chapter 1, verse 18, to chapter 3, verse 20, the first 17 verses were just an introduction, but that first section was about condemnation, the bad news, the fact that we are all sinners, we are all destined for eternal judgment before God. Whether you have the law of Moses or the law of conscience, it doesn't matter, we all stand guilty. But... Chapter 3, verse 21 through chapter 5, verse 21 was about the good news, justification, that God has declared us to be righteous in Christ Jesus. We have been accounted righteous. So even though we deserve death and hell, by the death of Jesus Christ, God has been able to pay the penalty of sin and now offer forgiveness freely. And then from chapter 6, verse 1 through the first half of this chapter, verse 17, we talked about sanctification which is the right now aspect of salvation. That we have been saved, but we are being saved. That the Holy Spirit comes to dwell inside us and give us power to overcome sin and power to endure suffering and how we have no further responsibility to the sin that condemned us. And that was our lesson last week, that in fact we are being adopted as sons by the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 18, it's the shortest section. It's going to go to the end of this chapter, verse 39, but that doesn't make it less important. This is about glorification, the future aspect of salvation, what we're looking forward to. We have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. And this is the happiest portion because we get to talk about what that salvation is going to look like when it is actually consummated. And the last thing we saw him say was that that wonderful adoption as sons that we discussed, that we call God Abba Father, is contingent. It says, we are heirs with Christ provided, as in, if we suffer with Him, in order that we may also be glorified with Him. And that's where we get that word for. And he's talking about suffering here, because he just said that to be an heir of God and an heir of Christ implies suffering with Christ. And I would say suffering with Christ is a fair summary and single sentence description of the Christian life. Suffering with Christ. That to be saved is to identify with Jesus from start to finish. We identify with his death. We identify with his resurrection. In fact, we are looking forward to the day when we will actually die in Christ and then when we will actually be raised in Christ. That just as He is going to return, we are going to return. That just as He is the Son of God, we are the sons and daughters of God. That the life of Christ becomes ours. But if that is the case, then the suffering of Jesus Christ on the cross is also ours. Suffering with Christ is an appropriate description of the Christian life. And the New Testament does not hide this fact. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 says, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. How's that for a biblical promise? All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. You remember Jesus said to the disciples, it is enough for a servant to be like his master. And if they've called me, Beelzebul, the son of the devil, what are they going to say about you? If they've taken me and nailed me to a cross, what are they going to do to you? In fact, he told us to rejoice because he said that's what they always do to the true prophets. Suffering with Christ. But when we hear that, when we hear of the need, and it is a need, look at that in verse 17 again, provided we suffer with him. You want to be an heir with God? Then you better suffer with Christ. But when you hear that, we begin to grow melancholy, shall we say. Oh, man, I signed up for this religion that promises me that I'm going to suffer. We can even start to panic. Start to think, well, what's going to happen to me? Well, what am I going to go through? What am I going to have to endure for Jesus Christ? And, and we don't like that so much. And I, I suppose that's fair. You don't have to like suffering. But we would rather say, don't talk about that. Talk about Christianity as a life of victory and glory. Now, listen, it is that. 
We're going to discuss that today. We've discussed it before. It is victory in Jesus. It is, as the word says, from glory to glory. But most of our glory as Christians is still to come. We are anticipating the future glory. We have the foretaste, as we sing, of glory divine. Another passage that probably comes out of this chapter here. And we have to endure while we wait for the glory. And it does us no good to not talk about suffering as a Christian. Because what you do is you set people up for failure. If you don't teach your kids that some people are not going to like you, and life is going to be hard, and there's going to be pain, and not everything is going to be fair, that kid is going to grow up and be smacked in the face by the world, aren't they? And we've all known friends like that. Maybe you were like that. You grew up thinking that, well, everybody's going to be nice, and everybody's going to be kind, and no one's going to want to be mean, and then you get your first job. <laughs> and your boss does not care. And in fact, your boss might take special delight in teaching people like you about what real life is like. That's life. That's suffering. And in fact, one of the sureties of life, even without Jesus, is suffering. That's the important thing to remember, because the devil will try to trick you into thinking you're only suffering because of Jesus. And if you didn't have Jesus, all this suffering stuff would stop. That's not true. But there is a promised increase and a special kind of suffering that cannot be avoided if you're going to have faith in Jesus. And you've got to come to terms with that. But knowing that that is true, he says that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us or in us. As a rule, we give our sufferings way too much power in our lives. They have way too much authority. They take up way too much headspace and heart space. And we use them to describe and define ourselves too much. It's not good. Whether it's physical pain or emotional distress, whether that's a hope that you had that was deferred, you always thought one day that apprenticeship was going to work out and you'd be partner now, or you thought that that scholarship was going to come through and then it didn't. Whether that's blessings that you've lost. One day I was on top of the world making this much money and now we're barely scraping by in this tiny little house. From the mightiest storm that really rocks your life to even the mildest little inconveniences. We allow ourselves to be defined by our suffering. That the most important events that happen to us are the painful things. Life is boring apart from that. If you cannot talk about yourself or about your life without bringing up all the hard, terrible things that have happened to you, if a conversation is moving along and everything is positive and happy and you just feel the urge to drag it back towards all the terrible things that have gone on, that's a problem. Because we can view suffering as an excuse to complain. To complain. The Bible tells us to do everything without complaining. I've got to complain. I've got to, I've got to vent. I've got to get it off my chest, man. You know what the Bible says? A fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man holds it back. Or to blaspheme even, to blame God. And here's, here's, a, real, here's a, a mature Christian thing you need to learn. Number one, well, I think when you first become a Christian, you learn not to, not to get blasphemous and to get in God's face, right? You need to be respectful. As you get a little more mature in Christ, you read the Psalms and you see that the psalmists were not afraid to be open and free and honest with their feelings with the Lord, right? And that God can handle that. But there's a third lesson that comes in that teaches you again, but God is God and you are not. There is a way to be honest and open before the Lord and to express what's in your heart without getting into that realm of being blasphemous and saying, how dare you, God? Putting your face in the finger of God and saying, how could you let this happen? And thinking that the Psalms somehow give you permission to do that. The Psalm 22 begins, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But it ends with trusting in the Lord. There's a difference between defying God and saying, I won't give you praise and respect and honor until you fix this. And saying, I'll give you respect and honor whether or not you fix this, but I would like to know what's going on. It causes us to neglect our worship. There are some folks, the first bad thing that happens to them, you will not see them in church until it's over. And you wonder, what are you doing on a Sunday morning that's going to help this situation? You're going to skip home group. You're going to skip prayer meeting. You're going to skip being around other believers because we're somehow convinced that it's going to work. Or maybe we're just mad at God. 
It even causes us to abandon God's word and sin. When everything's going good, we stand on God's word and we insist on God's word and we speak loudly to other people about it. But the minute something terrible starts happening to us, God will understand, I've just got to fix this now. That is not good. Especially, by the way, in a nation like ours, where the level of actual suffering is quite low. Shame on us for doing that. I'm not saying that you don't go through serious issues and terrible things, but you know where your next meal is going to come from. The hospitals will take you in whether or not you have the money for it. People around you will help you if you knock on the door and ask for help. There's a, an incredible governmental social safety net. We're the ones that argue about whether or not it's too big. Well, that's a luxury even to have that discussion right there, isn't it? You go to places like Africa and India and the jungles of South America, you know, never mind the coronavirus, they're dying of things like polio and measles and disease that have been cured. And we come here to where we are, benefiting from all this, driving around in three cars with ten iPhones and a couple televisions in the house, and we're going to act like we are suffering on the same level as some of these people. Worse than all that, though, the church as a whole hopefully not this church, but the church as a whole has imbibed the world's idea that the way to handle somebody going through something hard is affirmation rather than rebuke. There will be those that tell you, and fair enough, there is a place for this. If someone's going through a hard time, you know, just help them, stand there with them. Don't try to tell them how to deal with it. Don't try to tell them how to, how to think. Don't try to tell them how to think about it or, or to feel about it. Just stand there and be with them. And whatever they're going to do, just support them because that's what they need. Well, the Bible does say rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. But there is also a place for us as believers who know better to say, no, there is a proper way to go through this suffering. And how you go through your suffering will have major impact on the rest of your life. And we, as brothers and sisters that are not going through the same thing as you, have a special outsider's perspective to help you keep your heart on track. And there are many people that want to go online or go on TV and talk about, well, in the, in the church, when you go through something hard, everybody's always trying to tell you just to get over it and, and that Jesus is going to handle it. Well, we don't want to be rude, but at the same time, if somebody's beginning to drift into sin through their suffering, it is our responsibility to pull them back. But just because the world offers a critique doesn't mean it's a good one. We become like Job's wife. In Job chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, this is after Job has lost his family, his business, his possessions, and then finally his health. And his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. He says, why are you still worshiping this God? What has he done for you? He's taken everything from you. So throw it in his face and kill yourself. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. And in another place, he said, naked I came into the world and naked I shall return. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It is our responsibility as brothers and sisters in Christ, that when we see somebody drifting into that place where they're not just lamenting what they're going over, but they're beginning to blame God and to doubt God and to go into a sinful place, it's our responsibility to pull them back. It's our responsibility to be like Job and saying, you're speaking foolishly now. I know you're going through a hard time, but that's no excuse to start abandoning God's word. I remind you this morning, it is not only sinful to empower your suffering, it's not helpful. It's not a good thing to be constantly dwelling on all the horrible stuff that's happened to you. You know, when I was a teenager, the music that I listened to was really depressing. I listened to a lot of, of metal, and it was called emo, short for emotional music back then, and really like gothic, sad, depressing stuff. But here's the deal. I had a pretty great life. Everything was pretty good. Like, I had parents that loved me, and I had friends at school, and I had a job and a car, and so I'd have to sit there listening to this music, and you're wanting to feel it, but I'm, i got to think of the tiniest little thing to maximize. Oh, I got a B plus on the test, not an A, you know, and oh, she talked to me yesterday, but not today, and you know, she was homesick, but oh, she doesn't love me anymore, you know. It's, it's foolishness to do that, but you can really do that. The, the things you give the most energy through your words and the things you write online and the things that you think about, it's not just going to be taking up space in your life, but in your head and your heart. And even things that are not that big a deal begin to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Haven't we found this to be true as a nation over these last few years? We've had some serious things 
that we're going to be writing books and history about. We had the, the election that was a gigantic circus that we all went through. We went through the, the racial tensions and the riots and the protests, and now we're going through the pandemic and, and all kinds of stuff going on. But have we not learned hyper-focusing on that stuff does not make you a better person? Spending all your time thinking about it. it you, you know, maybe you've been like this or you know somebody like this. That's all they can talk about. Say, hey, man, how are you doing? Well, you know, the liberals are blah, blah, blah. Hey, I was asking how you're doing, man. I don't want to know what's going on in Washington, D.C. How are you doing? Oh, that Trump, you know what he's been? I didn't ask about President Trump. I was asking about you. What else is going on? Uh, I don't have anything else going on. Well, yeah, you do because it's all you're focused on. This is true not just for that but for your whole life. I think I might have got a little close to home for some of y'all, but I'm not sorry about that. What's going on in your life? If all you can talk about is, well, I'm, I'm still sick. Oh, well, my kids are still not doing well. Oh, the job is still hard. Oh, the house, I don't know where the money's going to come from. It's still difficult. That's, well, those things are always going to be there. Are you going to spend your whole life focused on that? And sometimes we lose one suffering thing, and we're, we're very quickly looking for the next thing to plug in the hole, whether we do it on purpose or not. We define ourselves by those things. We can't pray without lifting up some horrible thing going on. We can't just say, thank you, Lord, for this day. You're such a good God. I don't really have anything going on. Thanks for today. We've got to dig up something to, to gripe about. But look at Paul here. Paul tells us here that it is unworthy to compare this present pain to heaven's glory. Look at that. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. He says, why are you going to compare this pain, real as it may be? Paul got beaten and flogged a couple times. He says, what, am I going to compare that to heaven's glory? My adoption as a son of God? 1 Peter 4, 12-13. Peter, who ended up being crucified upside down, said, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Very similar passages here. But Peter's telling us, don't think that suffering, especially suffering as a Christian, is abnormal. It's not. It's totally normal. The world will... Try to tell us, well, life is suffering. We know better than that. It's not just suffering. And the church will try to tell us, once you get saved, you should never have to suffer ever again. Well, that's not true either. If anybody ever told you that, they didn't read their Bible very well. If your sufferings, and they are, are working to bring about your sanctification, and also they're a foretaste and a condition of your glorification, how can we complain? This suffering that I'm going through is making me a better believer and not only that, because I'm suffering for Christ's sake, the Bible says it's a sign that I really belong to Jesus. So how can I complain? Do not empower your pain. It's unworthy, Paul says, of a Christian. So that's the, that's the point. But I can think of a million objections that would come up to that. And the first one is, is accusation. You say something like, well, that's just downright insensitive. To tell a congregation full of people, you don't know what they're going through, that they shouldn't be overwhelmed. That instead they should rejoice in the middle of suffering, especially in 2022. You know, every year for some reason is like we have to change the rules for it. Or whatever other tragedy is going on. You can't just tell them that they can't let suffering take up space in their mind. Well, this has often been an accusation brought against the church, and sometimes it's been accurate. Where somebody comes up trying to share what's going on, everybody says, oh, don't, don't speak about that because then you're going to give it power, and if you don't talk about it, it doesn't exist. That, that's not true. That's not how it works. So, well, you speak out, you're speaking out in a lack of faith, therefore it's going to happen. It's not magic. Like, faith is not magic that like, in, summons things into your life. Jesus was, was quite aware of what was really going on in the people around him. So let's look at what Paul says. How do we answer that? That says, you can't tell me not to, not to let this take up too much space in my head. You can't tell me not to, not to compare this to heaven. Well, look at verse 19. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. 
Well, he begins here in this section by, by giving a, a stated truth here. That creation is waiting, it's groaning. Creation is waiting for the revelation, the revealing of the sons of God. Now, creation here is not so much referring to people as much as the ground itself, the, the earth that God has made. He says he's waiting for our revelation. Pretty cool, that word for revealing, revelation in your Bible is the word apocalypse. It's where we get the word for revelation, the last book of the Bible. And it means, of course, to reveal. That is, it's waiting, the earth is waiting for the day of Christ's return, which Paul describes as the revealing of the sons of God. And who is that? That's you and me. We just read about that in the previous verses. For we are sons of God by whom we cry, Abba, Father, right? So when Jesus Christ returns, Colossians 3 verse 4 says that we also will appear with him in glory. That's a radical thing to think about, isn't it? That when Jesus returns, it's also going to be your return. At his glorification, it's also going to be your glorification. And the earth is waiting for that. It's waiting for that final day. And he reminds us of what happened in the beginning. That creation was subjected to futility. That, of course, was the fall of man that happened at the very beginning. God created the world. He placed Adam and Eve in the garden. And he told them, that they should not eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, lest they die. Yesterday we were at the house and my son Colton says, can I have an apple? He says, yeah, you can have an apple. And then my daughter Josie May says, Eve ate the apple because the snake told her to. And I'm like, well, Colton's allowed to eat an apple. He goes, yeah, but she ate the apple. And she was like, I don't know if we should be eating these apples because, you know, the last time it didn't go so well. Of course, it doesn't say apple, it says fruit, but it's, it's all the same, right? But of course they did. They, they listened to the temptation of Satan who said, you shall not die, you shall be like God. Two lies. And they ate the fruit, and God cursed the world. He cursed the serpent, he cursed Eve, and in Genesis 3, 17 through 18, here's the curse that he placed upon Adam, which really was mostly upon the world, if you read this. To Adam, God said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return." In the beginning, the earth was under the domain of Adam. He was the one that God had placed to have dominion over the world. That was part of the image of God that Adam shared, is that he had dominion over God's world. But he forfeited that rule when he sinned. He forfeited that over to the devil, who is repeatedly in Scripture called the prince of the power of the air, the god of this age, the spirit that is at work in the sons of iniquity. When Satan was tempting Jesus, he said, I'll give to you all the kingdoms of this world, for they are mine to give. Jesus didn't dispute that fact, did he? Because it had been handed over, over to the one that had tempted and lied. And God cursed Adam, but look, do you see that he mostly cursed the ground? Up till now, the world was a paradise. It was untamed, but you, you see that the curse was the ground will produce thorns and thistles. It'll be hard for you to grow your food. If you've ever been involved in trying to grow something, you're like, I put it in the ground, I watered it, there's been sun, why did it just die? doesn't make any sense. Well, that's what the Lord cursed the ground for. He says, and someday you will return to the earth. Instead of a paradise, there's a hostile wilderness waiting for you. Paul says here, the world was subjected to futility. I want to circle that word. It's the same Greek word that when they translated the Hebrew Old Testament, this is the word they chose to use to translate vanity in Ecclesiastes. You've read that before, haven't you? Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. That word futility is a pretty good word there. Futility. Then you read the book of Ecclesiastes, and it's that unending cycle of life. He goes, you think life's all about money? Well, what happens? You make a lot of money, you grow old, you die, you hand it to your son, and he squanders all of it, and then what was all that for? You think life's all about knowledge and, and gaining wisdom? Well, then you get old and you die, then what? And the fool dies the same as you. Is, are we really any better than the dogs? They die and we die, and that's just life. It's a real honest book of the Bible. 
And so by saying the earth was subjected to futility or vanity, he's saying the world has been subjected to that repeated hopeless cycle. I shouldn't say hopeless because this passage is all about hope, but you understand what I mean. We must know, and this will help you in your sufferings, that the world, as he says, is in bondage to corruption. Things don't just get better, despite what some folks want to say. You know, it's never anybody that's living in some war-torn, terrible third world country that believes things just get better, you know. It's always folks that are incredibly wealthy and incredibly privileged and say, I think life is just good, you know. Everything just gets better all the time. Not really. The world is in bondage to corruption. You put milk out on the, on the counter for a few days, it doesn't become like super milk. It gets nasty. It gets gross. Things corrupt not just people but the earth itself. And the world will try to throw this in the face of God and say, what kind of God would create a world like this? Listen, folks, God didn't create it like this. That's the whole point. I, it baffles me when, when even apologists and pastors sometimes try to engage the discussion on that level. Why does God let things happen this way? Well, God is wise. No, 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 no. The world is cursed. Well, if I say that, they'll laugh at me. Well, they're wrong. The world is cursed. It's not the way God made it. Therefore, by the way, and this is only a little sub point, any scientific attempts to discover what the past was like from looking at the present is necessarily flawed because the world was corrupted. It's not always been this way. So for us to look at the way things are now and extrapolate it backwards, if you are a Christian, doesn't work. So it doesn't matter what the formula spits out. It's not what the Bible teaches us. The earth, it says, is groaning. It began when Cain killed Abel. Genesis 4, verse 10, God said to Cain, The blood of your brother cries out to me from the ground, for the earth was made to drink the blood of man for the first time. Never God's intention. And it continues to this day through things that had just happened, as we say, naturally, and through what men have done. The world groans through things like ice ages and floods. It groans through pollution and through dust bowls and cancer and things like abortion and war. The world is groaning. Hurricanes and tornadoes. Nuclear bombs. The world is groaning because it's not the way God intended it. And I might add to this, by the way, we still have a biblical mandate to take care of the earth that God has given to us. And however you may agree or disagree with somebody's politics regarding the matter, do not let that take away from the fact that God didn't intend his world to be gunked up and ruined by his people. Think about that on your own time. But what we learn from this is that everything is broken. Suffering is inescapable while we are alive. And there's no sense in denying the fact that suffering is real. We can get all, all happy in here and talk about we're never going to suffer again and it's all going to be okay and God's going to deliver us. God does deliver us, but sometimes God calms the storm and sometimes God helps you survive the shipwreck. Suffering is real and that matters. We gain no points for Jesus by denying that. And I do not minimize your pain or anybody else's in here. Whether that's your physical pain, your financial struggles, the relationships that you've gone through, I don't minimize any of that. There is, in fact, wisdom, the Bible teaches us, in toning down our celebrations a little bit. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 2 says it is better to go to the house of mourning than the house of feasting, because you'll take it to heart. Sometimes it's good to remember that life isn't all sunshine and rainbows, and in fact, it's very hard for a lot of people. Psalm 90 verse 10 says, the years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Short and hard, that's life, according to Psalm 90, verse 10. But hear this now. It is not God who has inflicted that upon us because he's just capricious and wanted to see how we'd handle a hard world. It was the failed stewardship of man, both in the Garden of Eden and down to today. It's not like we say, well, if I got a chance to start over, I'd do better. No, we wouldn't. Because your garden, whatever it is, your family, your state, your job, your nation, your kingdom, they all fall. Because no one is a good steward. We learned that in the first part of Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3. 
It is the evil work of Satan and the wicked work of sin that has done this. So while Paul tells us that the sufferings of this life are not worth comparing to the glory that's to be revealed, we must also remember that that suffering is real. It is part of what the Bible teaches, and there's nothing to be gained by minimizing the pain somebody's going through. However, I kind of skipped over another aspect of those verses we just read, which is the nature, the kind of groaning that we're going through. Picking up at verse 23, not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Now Paul affirms that we also groan. And y'all have probably done some groaning over the last couple of years. All the greatest artists and the greatest philosophers, they're groaning. So why do things have to be this way? But look now to the character of that groaning, which we already saw in these previous verses, but now Paul gives it again, that he compares that groaning to that of childbirth. That kind of groaning. Suffering with a purpose. Suffering with a goal at the end of it. He's used words here like eager. Groaning eagerly. <laughs> he used words like hope and freedom and redemption. These describe why and how that we groan. We're groaning because we are so ready for the coming glory that we just can't get used to the pain of life. I know life is pain, but I know what is coming, which is why I just can't get used to this. That's like the pain of childbirth. It's painful, it's awful, but at the end, a baby is born. And the joy that comes in that moment overshadows all the pain that came before that. Now, gentlemen, you know it doesn't do any good to minimize your wife's pain when she's going through it. You tell, hey, we're going to have our baby. She knows that, but she might yell at you if you say that in the moment. But at the same time, in between the pains, every mother is deliriously happy about the coming baby. And some of them will even go back for seconds and thirds. The worst pain that people can experience. And women do it over and over again on purpose. That's how Paul chooses to describe the groaning and the suffering that we go through in this life. He says he's groaning. Let me just read some of these phrases again. In hope that creation will be set free from the bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We're groaning as we wait for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. In this hope, we were saved. Because there is going to come a day when all this suffering will end, and Jesus Christ is going to return to rule and reign upon this world for a thousand years. Turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 47. This is a great little passage that describes the healing of the broken world that I just discussed. I could have picked any number of passages about the millennial kingdom when Jesus will rule and reign on the earth. Revelation chapter 20 is an amazing one. But I like this one. It's, it's so beautiful to, to read, and I wanted to make sure we got a chance to see it. Ezekiel has just been revealed the, the second coming of the Lord when he establishes his rule and reign, the new temple. And he brought me back to the door of the temple. And behold, water was issuing from below the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faced east. The water was flowing down from below the south end of the threshold of the temple, south of the altar. Then he brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around on the outside to the outer gate that faces toward the east. And behold, the water was trickling out on the south side. So do you have this picture? There's water flowing and trickling out of the temple. And he goes to see it. And going on eastward with a measuring line in his hand, the man measured a thousand cubits and then led me through the water and it was ankle deep. Again, he measured a thousand more and he led me through the water and it was knee deep. Again, he measured a thousand and led me through the water and it was waist deep. Again, he measured a thousand and it was a river that I could not pass through for the water had risen. It was deep enough to swim in a river that could not be passed through. And he said to me, son of man, have you seen this? So this is a trickle of water that's kind of like one of those water features you see where it goes over the steps. But as it goes along, it doesn't dry out like water does. It gets deeper and it gets stronger. 
It starts out just as a little trickle, and then it's ankle deep, and then it's knee deep, and then you can wade through it, and then you can't even swim across it. And he led me back to the bank of the river. Verse 7, as I went back, I saw on the bank of the river very many trees on the one side and on the other. And he said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah and enters the sea, the Dead Sea. Called the Dead Sea because it's so salty you can float in it and you can't drink the water. But this river will flow into the Dead Sea. And when the water flows into it, the water will become fresh. And wherever the river goes, every living creature that swarms will live. And there will be many fish. For this water goes there, that the waters of the sea may become fresh. So no longer salty seas. So everything will live where the river goes. Fishermen will stand beside the sea. From Engedi to Eniglaim, it will be a place for the spreading of nets. Its fish will be of very many kinds, like the fish of the great sea. But its swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They are to be left for salt. And on the banks on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, nor their fruit fail, but they will bear fresh fruit every month, because the water for them flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food, and their leaves for healing. He describes this river flowing out of the temple that runs out and heals the world. And if you've read the book of Revelation, you know the kind of things that are going to happen. The waters become bitter. All the fish die. The, the nation is scorched. The, the grass is burned up, and the trees are almost all gone. But when Jesus Christ, it says, returns to establish his kingdom, from that passage and in many others, the world itself will be healed. It won't just be the righteous reign of Christ, although it will be. It won't just be people learning the name of Jesus. It will be the world itself being healed. For those thousand years, it says Satan will be bound. No temptation for a thousand years. Jesus will reign in Jerusalem. The saints will serve his kingdom. And a river will flow from the temple to heal the nations. That hope hangs over every terrible thing that we go through on this world. That the kingdom with a capital K is coming. So because it's coming and because we know it's coming, that gives us a little bit of perspective on the suffering that we have now. He says, we have the first fruits of the Spirit. The first fruits are when most of the harvest isn't ready, but those early apples, those early grapes, those, that early grain is ready. And you can harvest that, but you've got to wait for the rest. That's what we have, the first fruits of the Spirit. We are under the new covenant, and in a sense, the kingdom of God is shed abroad on our hearts, but we're waiting for the actualization of that kingdom. We're waiting for the day when it will all be consummated and the full harvest will come in. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. We're tasting it now, which is why we groan. It's like when your mom lets you try the, the cookie dough before the cookies are made. That was so delicious, and now I want the rest. Well, you'll have to wait for the rest. Oh, but it was so good. It's so good, I want the rest of it. We have the indwelling presence of God, but the harvest has not come in yet. So we groan. We're waiting for the redemption of our bodies. We look at those that are walking in sin and those that are hungry and thirsty and the, the natural disasters that ravage the earth and we say, Lord, how long until that day comes? But we must never let that groaning become complaining and cursing because you know what's waiting right around the corner. Haven't you ever told your kid, well, you can't have any dessert if that's going to be your attitude while you wait for it? Haven't you ever seen somebody waiting for something that's going to be good for them and their attitude is so rotten, you're like, you shouldn't even give it to them. We can't do that with the Lord. We can't complain, say, this is taking too long, and if God really loved me, he wouldn't let me go through this. Say, so, you know, I know the Bible says that I've got to honor my, my husband and I've got to love my wife, but this is just getting too hard. I'm not doing it anymore. God will understand. No, no, no. When you consider the glory and the wonder of the coming kingdom that will last for a thousand years and then eternity to follow, how can you take this light momentary affliction and say, this is going to cause me to give all that up? It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And I do mean light momentary affliction. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18 says, We do not lose heart. We go through persecution, but we don't lose heart. We go through pandemics, but we don't lose heart. We lose jobs, but we don't lose heart. Relationships fall apart. We get sick. Loved ones die, but we do not lose heart. 
Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Your life is so short. Don't y'all feel like you just graduated high school? Like, where did all these... That kid was a baby last time I talked to him. And now, now there's a, the flower girl that was in our wedding. who's turned 16. I'm like, how did that happen? When did that happen? Where was I? Does time work differently where they live? Is it like Narnia? Because it's only been about five minutes. Life is so short. So because life is so short, to let that dictate your eternal attitude is foolishness. I'm going to let this one second determine how I'm going to spend the next million years. It was hard. Yeah, but it was short. It was over so fast. We have hope, and hope makes all the difference. You can suffer if there's hope, can't you? You can, su you can suffer with a smile on your face, too, if you have hope. The Lord is able, has been able to bring Christians through being ravaged by lions and wild beasts, through crucifixions and concentration camps and gulags and the loss of job and the loss of money. The Lord is able to sustain you through whatever you're going through. You might say, well, I don't see it. All I can, everywhere I go, I see the pain. I can't see the coming glory. Well, of course you can't. He says, Why? we don't hope for things that we see. You don't, you don't have something and then hope for it. You don't get your paycheck and you're on your way to the bank and say, I really hope I get paid. You just got paid. You're not hoping for it. Hope makes all the difference. There wouldn't be hope if we saw it. But if you do have that hope, then your response ought to be, as we see the last word of this section, is patience. Patience is not just enabling you to sit quietly while you're at the DMV. Patience is enabling you to go through decades of life watching society fracture, watching families fall, fall apart, watching your body be racked with pain and struggle, and be patient knowing that what's going to come is going to make all that look foolish. You're not even going to remember all of it. And we say things like, are we going to forget what, what happened during our lives? No, God's not going to erase your memory, but it's going to be so good, you're not going to care. Why do I care what happened to me then? It was so short. It was like five seconds. You don't look back and reminisce on how hard it was when you were two. I barely remember that. Yeah, but you cried an awful lot. It was a pretty rough time for you. So what's, what's the deal? Well, now just things have just gotten so much better, and I realize how foolish all those things I cried about were, because I was going to get fed. I didn't need to cry and scream about it, you know? And actually taking naps are kind of nice, so I didn't know what I was talking about. It's the same thing right now, Christian. Don't you know what's coming is going to make what's happening now look so small and insignificant? I don't know it doesn't feel that way now, but you've got to know that, in fact, that's what it is. And let that attitude be over how you handle your suffering. We all have hope as Christians, and we all deal with the pain of life. So the question becomes, which one has power over you? Does your suffering have power over you, or does the hope of Jesus Christ have power over you? Which one are you letting dictate your attitude and your behavior, and the way you talk, and the way you post online, and the way that you pray? If you let your pain dominate you, your present tribulations, your past abuse. You could have gone through some serious, terrible stuff when you were younger. Your future fears, yeah, things are going good now, but I just don't know what's going to happen. If you let those things dominate your thoughts and your words and decisions, your life will be only groaning. It'll be only suffering, only struggle. And it'll be a temptation to sin. Because you'll think, the way that I can fix this, I, I've got to sin. Like when Abraham was brought into, into Egypt and he knew that Pharaoh was going to come for his wife, so his solution was to sin. It didn't work. It made things worse. And when you only groan, you only let yourself think about suffering, you feel like you get lots of attention when you're suffering. You feel like that's how I've lived my whole life, so I, I can't just stop thinking about it. It's going to be a temptation to you. And Satan will start to whisper in your ear, God doesn't love you. Is this the Christian life? How do you even know that heaven's real? So why are you going to keep following Jesus if this is all he can offer you? It's a lie. Don't fall for it. Because you're going you're to stop following Jesus and then what? 
You've still got a painful life to walk through. You've still got cancer. You've still got this past. You've still got whatever it is you're dealing with. Except now you don't have Jesus Christ to support you. You don't have the church to hold your hand and cry with you. You don't have hope of glory. But if you let the past work of the cross and the present first fruits of the Holy Spirit and the future hope of your glorification fill you not with, with groaning but patience then you're going to have joy even as you groan. You'll go through the hard times and you'll weep and you'll cry and you'll ask for relief from the Lord, but you'll know that these are birth pangs. It's painful and it's in fact as painful as anything I've ever heard of, but I know what the result is going to be, so it's worth it. I'm going to become more like Jesus through this suffering. If I'm suffering with Christ, then it's an evidence that I'm going to be glorified with Christ. Therefore, I rejoice in my suffering. So will you today, knowing all of that, knowing that suffering is real, but that the hope that is coming is so much greater, will you commit today to stop empowering your pain and instead say, I'm going to endure with patience?